Hello, and welcome to another segment of Discussing Fitchburg Now. I'm your host, Sam Squalia. We are coming to you from the Workers' Credit Union Virtual Studios, thanks to Fitchburg Access Television. And this segment, we are following up on our last show with Haitian Outreach, following up on their trip to Haiti in March of this year in 2020. And uh, here to talk about it with me, I have Pauline Aliskevitz. She is one of the directors of Haitian Outreach. Thank you so much for coming on. Hello, Sam. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. You know. It's good, it's good to see you again. Normal. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you were able to um, actually go to Haiti in the middle of this, well, I mean, right before this pandemic, right? In early March. Let's talk about your, your trip. Yes, so we were leaving the uh, 10th of March, which was a Tuesday, and we had a direct flight for the first time to Port-au-Prince, went beautifully. We had a wonderful week there. We had um, six schools that we normally see. We went to five, and actually one of those schools, they thought it was a little dangerous for us to go, so they brought the children into an, one of the schools nearby for us. So we had two classrooms going at the same time. We were interviewing the children, giving them their backpacks, taking their pictures and their demographic information. So we saw 329 out of 349 students in our program, which is wonderful, wonderful. So, so you um, are, a, are a program that sponsors students in, in Haiti and provide backpacks and other, other resources thanks to the many volunteers uh, and sponsors that you have here in America and in Canada. Um, and you have been running this since... What, 1998? Uh, 1998 was when it actually started. And John and I, my husband John, are the third couple to run this ministry. And we've, we're have we on our seventh year this year. I've been to okay. Haiti seven times. And it's a beautiful country. It used to be well known for it, a vacation spot. So it was probably high 80s when we were there, low 90s, with a beautiful breeze, and the flowers were blooming, and it was lovely. The children were in school, and the violence that they've experienced the last year had settled down quite a bit. Um, we always had drivers with us, and we had police escort to some of the schools just to make sure we got there and got out safely. We um, were about to leave on March 17th. We were looking forward to being in Boston on St. Patrick's Day, and JetBlue canceled all the flights on Monday afternoon. We were flying out on Tuesday. So we were kind of in a little panic, and we were very relaxed there, but we knew here things were heating up with the coronavirus, and things were starting to come to a standstill. So we were on the phone, three people, trying to get flights out. And we finally arranged for flights on Wednesday to leave the country. We split up on American and on Spirit. And we all got home safely. And then on Friday, things, things were happening here that we weren't really hearing about with the virus. And then on Friday, Haiti closed their airport. So because- Good thing you got out. <laughs> He sure made it out in the nick of time. And believe me, the prayers that we get from our sponsors in our parish, St. Bernard's and the schools really is what gets us in and out of there safely. So we all got home safely. And then the corona really hit and everything started closing down and shutting down. Luckily, yeah. I, I feel like uh, in the future, everyone will remember what they were doing the week of March 9th through the 17th, because that week fe felt like it lasted a month, um, because every day things were changing and we didn't know where we were uh, with this virus at any point on any day that week, I would say. Um, and so is that the kind of feeling that was happening in Haiti or was it uh, going a little slower there? It was slower there. People were just day to day working, going to school. All of our children were in school and things were pretty normal there until we left. 
we heard that there was one case of corona in the country on Wednesday when we left. And then um, as the, the last two or three months have gone by, they have under 100 cases there. So the people have been very fortunate not to have to deal with all of this. And that certainly includes the, the death and the passing of many, many people that this has brought on. The country itself does not have resources for the people there. They don't have food like we do. They don't have charities like we do. People who distribute food, schools that distribute food, they have none of that. Yeah, uh, you know, where is in the United States where we are able to, where most of us are able to um, isolate at home and go to the grocery store um, and isolate safely. Uh, in Haiti, there are a, a, there's a lack of resources to clean fresh water, let alone soap. And um, people live often uh, in crowded homes, making it hard to isolate. Exactly. We have one child who lives in a one room apartment and there are now eight people living there with her uh, and her parents. Her aunt had, um, there was a fire in Haiti last November, uh, a, a gas tank blew up. And so um, her husband passed away in that and two of her children had burns. They survived, but they moved in with the family, with her sister, because that's how they are there. They take care of each other. So they've got eight or nine people living in a one-room place. So to be home all day like that is very difficult. No running water to wash their hands. You think we can't find Purell. They have absolutely no idea probably what that product is. So they are fortunate that they have not had to deal with the repercussions of the virus as we have had. We are much more prepared here in the United States to be able to combat something like this that has been so devastating. Yeah, well, I mean, ironically, however, United States has uh, the most cases in the world. And Haiti, as you mentioned, has a very few cases. Um, of the coronavirus. Uh, the last I looked up at worlddometer.info, there are 663 total cases in the entire uh, country of Haiti and only 22 deaths with, they, they note 21 recovered. Um, but um, as, yeah. we, as we see them opening up um, more of the borders and the airport and more people in Dominican Republic um, opening up and more people coming home, do you anticipate uh, another spike in Haiti? Do you anticipate you having to help out um, with regards to the coronavirus effect? We have had to send some money to families for food because some of the stores closed and there is not food readily available or water readily available. While we're there, we have our own food that we eat because everything there is grown so differently than than here, and we don't want anyone to get sick. But we have sent um, money to families through Western Union. Thank goodness they've been open during all of this, and they were able to purchase eggs and bread and, and different foods that they have, rice especially, because that lasts a long time for a family, rice or pasta. They don't eat a lot of meat there. They don't have a lot of meat there. Um, they have goats and, um, there was a few cattle we saw this year, but not very much. Their medical facilities are not like ours either. You know, they don't have the equipment or the staff as we do to take care of people who are very, very sick. So it's very, it's a very different experience being there than here. Yep, they, uh, you know, we suffer from a lack of personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers and our general population. Um, but Haiti suffers from a lack of um, general hospital beds and general treatment um, providers. And on top of that, uh, a lack of, of PPE. Right, because there are hotels and other businesses are closed, just as ours are, people are not working. So they don't even have money to, to buy food or PPE, I'm sure, I don't even know if that's available there, to tell you the truth. Mm. It, there may be quite a lack of that there. 
and if they're in one room and someone brings it home, it would be devastating. So Is the they, government um, providing any any resources to their citizens, you know, like um, like the United States uh, provided the stimulus check and extended unemployment. Is there anything available like that to um, the people of Haiti? No, there is not. There are no resources there at all, which is one of the reasons Haitian Outreach has been there so many years, because the government provides no Medicaid and no welfare and no um, free hospitalizations. You know, if people are sick, they go to the hospital, they have no money, they can't pay for the hospitalization. So they get what they can and then they leave and then they have some kind of a big bill that they have to to try to compensate for. So they, they the comp the country does not provide anything for these people as we have here. We have soup kitchens, we have shelters, they have none of those things. It's a very generous organization um, that must help uh, so many people in in uh, Haiti. Uh, 300, what is it, 362 kids? Is that what it is? 329 we saw out of 349, so 349. 349. 349 kids. And, yeah. and what did you provide to them during this trip? So Haitian Outreach um, looks for sponsors. We have approximately 175 to 200 sponsors and donors, and they give $200 a year to support a child to go to school. $100 pays for the tuition, a uniform if they need it, or immunizations if the child needs it. The parents pay half of the tuition, they pay the remainder. So it's not just a freebie. Parents do participate in this process and help with the tuition also, because depending what grade it is, it costs more, just like here in the United States, it costs a lot more in kindergarten, pre-K and high school than it does in those middle years. Mm -hmm. um, so then we provide a full backpack with um, brand new shoes and brand new school supplies. And then when we have donations of beads or bubble liquid or lipstick or nail polish, we put those in the backpack, stuffed animals, um, according to the child's age, and we give each child their backpack. So for that amount of money, you can get, you can help a child. We also have what we call rice money. Rice money is given by the sponsor so that the family can have a little bit of extra money to buy food or water or for um, school needs if they need to buy books. We also have presently 15 college students who go to university in Haiti and we provide $500 a semester for them for their books. We help them with a laptop if they need it and they are in a variety of different um, tracks in the colleges between accounting and cosmetology and um, business administration a variety so we also help them to be able to stay in school and get a college education which is amazing especially for young women in haiti to finish high school and go to college it's amazing so the work that we do changes lives it's an incredible opportunity for for so many um do you ever um invite any of um the people that you've helped here to the united states to um to show them around well, we can do that with university students if they have the appropriate paperwork. It is not that easy to leave the country of Haiti as it is here. You have to have a passport and you have to have an identification and many people don't because they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. But we have had students in the past that have come and spoken to groups and at the church at St. Bernard's, we've had sisters that have come and spoken about the work that we do there and the work that they do in the schools, they run the schools for us. So um, yes, we periodically do. And we uh, ran into a young man who had become the manager of a hotel. We talked about that the last time we were together. And he said that he would come and talk to people if we wanted him to, but he's one of our successes. And those are the important things we like to show people is that what we do does have an end product that is successful. Well, I would just love to have him on the show if he ever comes here. Or, I mean, now that, you know, we can do virtual studios if he has access to uh, the Zoom 
platform, maybe we could maybe we could do a follow up interview like this. That would be really great. Well, um, that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, um, it, it, during this uh, pandemic, it's been difficult for nonprofit organizations to to do their normal fundraising. Um, yes. So uh, how do people contribute if they would like to sponsor a child? Uh, you know, how how do they find out how that they can contribute. So they should go to our website, which is HaitianOutreach.net. And it, it's Fitchburg based. So they should, you know, make sure they have the right Haitian outreach because there are many Haitian um, charities around. And they can use PayPal on our website and make a donation if they would like. Some people don't want to be attached to a certain child for a long time. We have older children who are ready to graduate from high school, so you could do it for a couple of years or even one year. But if you'd like to make a donation, you can go to PayPal or you can mail a check to us made out to Haitian Outreach, P.O. Box 16, Fitchburg, Mass. 01420. And presently, we are uh, bringing our items down to St. Bernard's Church Hall and getting ready to um, fill our backpacks and ship them out in the, in the fall. So, you know, you're still working, even in the middle of this, and still preparing for, for everything that you normally do uh, to help uh, the kids in Haiti. Are you expanding that? Um, in light of the, you know, coronavirus pandemic, I know you said that you've provided some some funds. Do you have any plans to do anything extra on top of that? If we get extra donations after our backpack is completed, we sometimes make recommendations to schools. Uh, one of our schools actually put bathrooms in. They had outhouses and we were able to help them. They're still waiting for some money for a couple of toilet bowls to be put in. <laughs> so we are going to help them with that. But as you say, we haven't been able to fundraise. We usually do an UNOS fundraiser and uh, we had a pancake breakfast, but then everything kind of stopped. So uncertain how things are going to go this year and people not working. It's, um, it's a worry for nonprofits, I think. And the work that we do is so important with those children in Haiti and the sisters in their schools that we just hope that we'll be able to continue what we're doing and be able to ship. If the ports are closed, we can't ship. So we're just taking it day by day, week by week, hoping things will go back to normal very soon. Are the ports closed right now in, in Haiti? I actually don't know, but they were closed when the airport was closed, but the airports are open. So I would think the port is open there now and we're hoping it stays open because we don't know what the coronavirus is going to do. It's so uncertain in the fall or as we proceed into the future. So we hope everything will go along and we plan to go back again in March if everything is quiet and safe. So. Uh, moving forward with your standard uh, plans, well, what are what are what are you looking at for the rest of the year up to March of uh, 2021? What's the schedule of uh, your of your of your work and your your planned uh, plan for um, raising money? Right now, I am knee deep in paperwork. Our tuition paperwork is going out to our sponsors so that they can respond in July. And then the tuition will be sent to the schools in August. We send it to the sisters who distribute it to the schools and the principals meet with each parent of every child that's in our program and settle up their tuition. We have probably about 15 children that are unsponsored this year. So we're still looking for sponsors. We are presently bringing down our notebooks and pencils and pens and um, stuffed animals and everything we have down to the church hall. We are open, provided we can meet as a group um, with the corona. We are open in June through August for volunteers on Saturday afternoons. Find that information on our website. And uh, people come down and help us uh, count out pencils and pens so that we can put them in our over 300 backpacks. The backpacks are filled and put into 45 gallon 
containers, which we receive from Sterilite in Townsend. They are very generous to us. And then we strap them all up and label them all up. And we have a shipper who comes in from Roxbury and uh, he picks them up and they go on a big ship and it takes about six weeks for them to get to the port of Haiti where they go through customs and they're delivered to our warehouse there. So um, it's, a, it's an extensive process and it all works well because we have a Haiti sh a shipper who's Haitian here and his brother is at the port in Haiti in Port-au-Prince and he gets the shipment and then our manager goes down and is there when they open the bins and look at them and then the whole thing is brought up there and it sits there until we get this. So about November, everything is there waiting for us and then we have our winter and the holidays and we plan to go in March and see the children again, deliver their backpacks. That's, that sounds very nice. And I'm so glad that you are able to continue doing this work. Uh, and I'm so appreciative that you uh, and your husband, John, uh, took the reins of this uh, Haitian outreach program um, from, from, your, from your predecessor uh, to keep it going. You know, sometimes uh, with, with a leader of an organization, when they leave everything, um, everything leaves with them, but, uh, but not with Haitian outreach. You have a, a standard of, of longevity and success. Thank you. And we appreciate that you are willing to have us on your show and to advertise for what we do because word of mouth is a big tool for us. You know, when people see us, they realize that what they get is a picture of the child. We see the child every year. You're not just sending it to some address somewhere in the world that you don't even know about. Mm. Uh, we have hands on with our children and with the backpacks. So we appreciate Sam that you have allowed us to be on your show again. And we hope maybe in the fall, in the late fall, when everything is shipped, we'll be able to come and do a little update again. Sounds great. Um, so if you at home are interested in sponsoring a child from as from a small amount to the full shebang, you can go to HaitianOutreach.net and uh, use PayPal to sponsor that child or you can send a check as uh, Pauline had mentioned to PO Box 16 in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, 01420 make that out to Haitian Outreach. Thank you so much, Pauline Aliskevitz, the uh, co-director with her husband, John, of Haitian Outreach, uh, which is located here in Fitchburg. Thank you so much for coming on and telling us about what you do. And we hope to have you on soon and let us know what the updates from your, your fall backpack drive. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors and donors because without them, we wouldn't be able to do what we do for the children of Haiti. Uh, Absolutely. All right. And thank you so much at home for watching and learning a little bit more about what we do here in Fitchburg with our many gracious organizations. Uh, we will see you next segment. on another virtual segment of Discussing Fitchburg Now from the Workers' Credit Union Virtual Studios, thanks to Fitchburg Access Television. I'm your host, Sam Squalia. And for this segment, we have Chuck Seglin, who is the owner, producer, and star of Chuckin' Dirt, the YouTube channel where Chuck shares all of his 
Eins and all of his times that he doesn't really find a lot, all with <laughs> us on video on YouTube. Thank you so much, Chuck, for coming on and chatting with us about metal detecting. Well, thank you for having me, Sam. Pleasure to be here, virtually. All right, so, so you started your YouTube channel, which is Chuck and Dirt, uh, yep. after Chuck and your yep. Chuck and Dirt. Uh, yep. Very clever, love it. Thank you. Um, you started your YouTube channel almost two years ago, uh, July of 2018, correct? Yeah, yep, that's about right. Yeah, and so- Yeah, yeah. I've been, uh, I started it back then. What, what had happened was I was, I started metal detecting back in about 2014. I had seen some YouTubers online and uh, one in particular who I really like. And uh, I really caught the bug, I got hooked. I said, this is something I wanna try. I wanna go out there and see if I can save a little history. The problem is that um, all of the public venues that you can hunt in have already been hunted by a lot of other people. Um, so I needed a way to get on private properties. Um, now, one way to do that is to walk up to people's front doors and knock on doors, and that makes me very nervous. So then I started sharing videos on our local uh, community forum, the Discussing Fitchburg Now group, uh, before I got the YouTube channel started. And that drummed up interest and got me permission so that I could help people find stuff in their, on their properties. And from that, the YouTube channel just sort of developed so I could reach a wider audience. So you got started did, uh, from metal detecting. You got the bug for metal detecting watching YouTube videos. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite YouTuber is uh, a guy whose name is Bo Huimet. Uh, that's O-U-I-M-E-T-T-E. -E. He goes by the name Aquachigger online. And uh, he was a detectorist who specializes mostly in Civil War relics. He's down in North Carolina. And uh, he was metal detecting in a river and discovered 170 odd silver coins in the river. This would have been a bag that would have, been, would have fallen off the back of a horse that was fording the river. No one noticed that the bag fell off and all the coins were lost in the river and they waited there almost, almost 200 years before he found them. It was a fortune in silver coins. And he shot video as he found them. So it's a really, I mean, for me, it's a really exciting video to watch. And, uh, and since then, he's done quite well for himself. He's taken that opportunity and parlayed it into a business. And now he sells metal detectors and things like that. So he goes, uh, you know, all these metal detecting companies, they give him sponsorships. He travels all over the world and puts on events and things like that. So that one, that one hunt, that one success, he parlayed it into a whole lifestyle. I'm not looking to do that, but uh, that was a heck of a video to watch. It got me really excited. And I was like, I want to do something like this. I want to find something old and interesting. So and I've it, never found- it's really, it's really the medium of video that allows you to, to share it with other people and, and get them excited about what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's been the best part. The best part I think has been the, the sharing it. The, um, I'm always very conscious, you know, when I, when I pull a relic out of the ground and I'm, I'm videoing it, it never, seems to leave my my consciousness that this is the first time this object has ever been photographed you know um because it existed before we had cameras <laughs> when i take it home it's this first time riding in a car um it's just very very strange to be able to reach across time like that and it's such a weird feeling that i want other people to experience it because uh, i think it helps drum up interest in the hobby i mean one of the other problems we have as detectorists is we're a very small community and, you know, a, a lot of people, they get a little bit, and you can understand why, they get a little bit wary if they see someone out in the park with a shovel or on someone's lawn with a shovel digging What's holes. What's that guy doing over there? That, that kind of thing. And so that's, that's another reason why I want to share, to get other people interested in this, to say, this is cool. I'm not, I'm not a home wrecker. I'm not running around tearing up the neighborhood. You know, once I leave, you can't even tell I've been there. Uh, if you do it right, then, you know, it's not a problem, so. Yeah, so most people, when you think of a metal detector, you think of uh, a guy walking along the beach, uh, <laughs> you know, with the, with the little, the, it's like a round disc thing, and they're listening to something, waiting for the beep, 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 beep. Is, yep. that, is that what you use? You use the beep, beep, beep thing? 
yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it's called a metal detector. Um, the, the metal detector for us layman. This, this is the one that I use. It's 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 called a Mine Lab Equinox 800, and this is the control box up here. And down here is the big circular part that sweeps back over and forth over the ground. Ooh. And right there are the the headphones that I wear while I'm using it. If I wasn't wearing the headphones, it would be very noisy and. Uh, you want to try to be unobtrusive when you're doing this. You don't want to irritate somebody next to you having a picnic. They don't want to be listening to squelching and beeping and burping and all the other noises this thing makes. But um, yeah, a lot of people do it on the beach um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is, uh, well, it's very easy to dig on the beach. It's just sand. Uh, you can't ruin grass digging on the beach. You know, you don't have to be very careful or precise. You can just kick the sand aside. And um, the other thing is that there's a lot of human activity on the beach. So most of the guys who are on the beach hunting, they're not really there for the history. They're there looking for the jewelry that you dropped when you were at the beach, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, some of them are nice guys. And if there's IDs in the jewelry, they'll return it. The other ones are just looking to make money. Um, I don't do a lot of beach detecting. We're pretty far from the beach. And when I go to the beach, there's just way too much competition. There's people all over the place, you know? So, but yeah, that's, that's what most people think of, but most detectorists are actually out in backyards, woods, you know, on trails, things like that. Uh, we like to hike off into the woods and look for old um, foundations, the remnants of colonial houses that aren't there anymore. You know, you just got a little depression in the ground and after you've done it for a while, you can say, ah, yeah, this was a cabin. This was a house. Someone lived here. Let's, let's detect. We might find some relics. We might find some old things. Is but, that the yeah. first? Um, is that the first detector that that you purchased, or have you upgraded over time? Oh yeah, this is this is not the first one. No, 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 no. I just I just uh, picked this one up um, last summer. I started with uh, I started with Garrett detectors, uh, which I like. I still have an old Garrett detector that I still use, and uh, I used Garrett's for a while. I used an AT Pro for a while, and then I upgraded to an AT Max. And I had a lot of technical issues with that. And then I switched to MineLab, which is another manufacturer. They've got a very good reputation. And I went with the, the Equinox 800 and whew, uh, it's been a, a night and day difference for me. I mean, one of the things with metal detecting is um, when you get a new piece of equipment, it's good to go back to places you've already hunted out because every new, every piece of equipment is a little different and it will hear things you didn't hear last time. So taking this, uh, this beast <laughs> to uh, places where I've been before, I find lots of new things that I sit around scratching my head going, how did I miss this last time? But you know, it's just the nature of the thing. So, but yeah, so, I've, I've, used, I've used a couple different varieties. Segwaying on your, your finding new things. So when you are out there detecting, like you said, you're, you're interested in uh, the history and, yes. uh, but, you know, you'll find things from newer trash, bottle yep. caps, uh, general oh, yeah. garbage that might oh, yeah. uh, send off the metal detector to actual old historic um, uh, yeah. kind of snapshots in time, yes. Um, right? Yes, I've, I've found relics as old as 400 years and as new as four days ago. <laughs> so, you know, and, and it depends on where you go. It's one of the reasons why I like private property so much. Um, you know, a lot of people go to the park, they're conscientious, but enough people go to the park who aren't that, you know, over years and years and years and years and years, you might see a big, beautiful grassy green field and looks beautiful. And I swing this thing over it and I, you know, in, in a 10 foot area, I can pick up 100, 150 bottle caps and pull tabs and things like that. So it's very hard to hunt in those areas because there's so much scatter there's so much trash you, but in you'll people's get yards, it, it'll be like beep 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 and then you'll yeah, say oh. ah yeah oh yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of that um you know uh, they say uh if you want to do well in this hobby you need to dig everything if it beeps you dig it and that's fine for the younger guys but uh i can't i can't do that you know because i I mean, on an average on an average hunt that runs maybe four or five hours, I'll dig maybe fifty or sixty holes. If I were to dig everything that beeped, I would dig a, a thousand holes easy, you know. Mm -hmm. And my knees and back and arms just can't take that kind of labor. <laughs> and so. by now, you've probably gotten to to be, realize what a 
glass bottle cap sounds like. You're like, eh, no. Well, yeah. it's a little, there's a, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an art to it. There, there, we, we, we learn things over, over time, but those things are really heuristics. They work most of the time, but not all of the time. And sometimes you'll, you'll hear something that sounds like trash and you'll go, ah, dig it anyway. And then it turns out to be something great. So you can never be a hundred percent certain. It's sort of this cross off between how tired am I, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, maybe there's a hint of something it doesn't sound quite like an ordinary bottle cap. Maybe it's not, let's dig it, you know? So, uh, the young guys who can, who can just dig all day, you know, they can chase all those, all those targets and they'll probably find more things than I will. Cause I have to pick and choose because I'm just, I'm getting old, Sam. <laughs> you can't get it all, Chuck. No, um, I can't. So, you know, uh, so this, this, this hobby, uh, and mm. that you do with the metal detecting, it's uh, it's a passion of yours, right? And so yeah. it spurred, um, your, your YouTube channel. So it spurred you being a, also a videographer in addition to a historian, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. So on the YouTube channel, uh, um, we have uh, episode 100 coming up soon, that's right? That's correct. This weekend, yep. The big, the big 100. Yep. Yep. That's going to be from a, a hunt that was right here in Fitchburg, um, a beautiful old home. I was uh, there with one of my detectorists, a couple of my detectorist buddies, Tracy and Nancy, and uh, uh, we all dug some interesting things. I think the 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 big uh, the big thing that day was that was dug was dug by Tracy. It was a good conduct medal uh, awarded by the Army. And oh, when I she saw was, that in the newspaper. You saw it. Yeah, it ended up in the newspaper because she was cleaning it off and, and sharing pictures of it with me. And I said, Tracy, I think I see a name on it. And she looked closer and she said, you're right, there is. And then she and I sort of working together in tandem went out to all of our resources online. We were able to find not only the person who it was, but their nearest living relative, because that person had since passed away. And she got in contact with that guy and he was, wow, he was really over excited and overjoyed to get the medallion back, you know? And so she was able to return it to him. That's really the best part of this hobby is when you find something that's personal and you can return it to the person who, you know, who lost it. I've done that a few times and we've all done that a few times as detectives. It's just something we love to do. It's awesome. And so that's that that find uh, we can see some of in episode 100 on Chuck and Dirt on YouTube. Well, I wasn't filming when she found it, um, but I will be including some pictures of it and I'll include a little footage telling the story of what happened uh, in the episode. But you'll see some things that I found. Uh, I, I found a few silver coins and some other things, uh, uh, an old... Um, wind up clock from Germany, Germany and uh, some other interesting items. So you'll get to see all that. Uh, you know, that's, and that's one great thing about Chuck's YouTube channel is that he will film what he's doing and what he's finding. And then he'll, he'll, he'll talk about, uh, this is what I think it might be, but in the editing video process, you'll actually show a picture of the cleaned up item with yep. text that says exactly what it is. So us at home know exactly what you're you're looking at, even though you on your video, you, you don't know yet. Sometimes I don't know. Often I don't know. Sometimes I never know. Uh, I actually, <laughs> I kind of like that a little bit. I like having some mystery. Uh, you know, I find a curious old item and I know it's personal and I know it's interesting, but I can only figure out so much about it. But yeah, usually it's amazing the technology we have these days. Uh, usually you can track things down and get a very good idea of, of what they are, where they come from. So. so do you save all of your cool finds? Do you save all of your not cool finds? What, what do you do with the stuff that you find? I save most everything I find unless it's really trash. Um, there are occasions when I will find an art, a relic and it's in really, really bad shape. Um, if I am, uh, excuse me, <coughs> if I'm unable to clean and restore it, uh, I may end up discarding it, especially if it's something I have several examples of. Um, so like, you know, how many horseshoes does one guy need, right? How many oxen shoes does one guy need? Once you have a, a bucket full of horseshoes and oxen shoes, if you want a free horseshoe, I'll give you one. But, you know, at some point I can't keep them all, right? Mm -hmm. But the really cool things, you know, like the interesting relics that I only have one of or that 
that track to local history, you know, like something that's specific to Fitchburg, for example, um, or specific to my hometown. Yeah, those are the kinds of things I like to keep, um, especially really personal items. Uh, that just fascinates me when I find something and I know someone wasn't just change in their pocket. It was something that they wore or something that they treasured, you know, those kinds of things. I really just don't have the heart to part with them. What I do is um, I use these displays. They're called uh, Riker mounts, uh, which is basically a, um, you know, it's a cotton filled frame with glass on the top, pins to secure it close. And then I can put the objects that I find in there, including the, you know, little pieces of paper to remind me where they came from or what the object is. This item here is actually quite special. This was dug in Easton, but the house it was dug at was a house I got a lead on through someone here in Fitchburg. Um, this is a George Washington inaugural button. It dates to uh, 1793. Wow. These, these are quite rare and quite collectible, and this is actually a very rare variety. If this was in perfect mint condition, it would be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 grand. Um, in this condition, not much at all, you know. The, the really nice thing is though that I dug two of these together and the homeowner let me keep one. He didn't have to do that. You know, my policy. Um... <coughs> well, that's a good segue. So when you detect on people's private property, how does yep. that work? Do you keep the stuff you find? Well, ultimately it's all coming out of, you know, their ground, so it all belongs to them. So what I, what I, the arrangement I like to have with home, homeowners is this. Listen, you get final say on anything I find. So you get to see everything. And if there's anything you want, you, you get to take it. Um, if it's worth more than $100, I'm just going to give it to you right away. And just, you know, if I find a gold coin on your property, it's yours. Okay. Um, if it's worth less than $100, I'd really like to take it home. And that's just that that you know that's as that's as far as I go, so that they understand that's that I want to. That's you know that I want to bring something home. Obviously, if I'm going to go to someone's property and they're going to be like, "Well, I'm just going to keep everything you find," then I'll be like, "Well, in that case, maybe you should just get your own detector. I'll show you how to use it, and you should go have fun." Because if I can't bring anything home, there's really nothing in it for me, right? So, right. Um, but yeah, that's that's the arrangement that I like to have. And so. What is the kind of thing that you always want to find? Is it, is it the, the idea that you don't know what it is that you're looking for? Or are you looking for something ever specifically? Well, we like to find things that are easy to pin down to a specific era or a specific year. <coughs> so, for example, coins are great because they've got the date stamped right on them, right? If I dig a coin and it says 1783, I know it's from 1783, no mystery. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I dig something that's like part of a stirrup for a horse or you know, part of a, of a spur from someone's boot, then it's a lot more challenging. Uh, if it's a whole piece and it looks nice, yeah, that's exciting. But a lot of what we dig is just scrap. You know, it's, it's rotten to the point that no one could identify it. It's just a piece of chunky, rusty metal. So what we're really looking for are things that we can identify and things that we can pin down to either a specific date or an era. Like if I dig a pewter spoon, for example, that you can pin down to a specific era because pewter spoons were only used so long in the United States before people realized, hey, these things fall apart and they switch to other metals. You dig a pewter spoon, you know you've got a colonial spoon, it's from the 16 or the 1700s. You know? Whereas if you dig uh, an iron spoon, it could be from anywhere. You know, it could be from any time frame, right? So the more you can narrow it down in history, the better. Obviously, we love to find coins, we've got the year right on them. And again, like I said before, personal items are the best. Things that really connect to a person. So um, rings, jewelry, uh, hold coins, the coin that someone went to the trouble to put a hole through because they were hanging it around their neck because it meant something to them. Um, love tokens, those kinds of things are, are exciting to find. Uh, things that people uh, made, you know, like something that someone has gone to the trouble to carve themselves. Something that has someone's name written on it or their initials engraved on it. Those kinds of things. For that person in history? 
Exactly. That's the, that's the stuff that I just love to find. Um, so, then, so on that note, um, yeah. you know, uh, people might want to be looking for something on their own property, but they don't have the knowledge or the equipment like you have. So they want to contact you to let you come and uh, detect on their property. How do they contact you? Well, the easiest way to do that is, is to just uh, send a message to Chuck and Dirt on Facebook. There's a Chuck and Dirt Facebook page and uh, you can go there and you can just click the message button and drop me a message. You can uh, put a comment on one of my YouTube videos and I'll, you know, get in touch with you. Or you can, um, if we're, if you're in Pittsburgh and you're on the discussing Pittsburgh now, uh, news group, I'm on there all the time. So I'm pretty easy to find on there too. So there's a lot of different ways to reach me. I've been on there before. Have you? Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Once or twice. <laughs> all right. So thank you so much, Chuck Seglin of the star and producer of Chuck and Dirt on YouTube. You want to check out Chuck's uh, YouTube channel. It's really interesting. Chuck and Dirt on YouTube. You want to subscribe to that and click the little bell so that you always know when he uploads a new video, which is generally every week. Every and, Sunday. Uh, yeah, and uh, and the so the hundredth episode is coming up soon, and uh, I can't wait to check it out. Thank you so much, Chuck, for coming on and telling us all about your metal detecting uh, adventures. My pleasure. All right, great, uh, and thank you so much for watching at home and learning more about what's happening here in Fitchburg and our surrounding area. We will see you in the next show. Bye.